Now I look to the Right Honorable Sir Malcolm Rifkin to continue the case for proposition. Nothing became uh, the honorable gentleman who has just spoken uh, more than the conclusion of his speech. It brought back to me the immortal words of John Donne. Never cease to forget for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. I want to reassure this audience that I have no intention of giving a long lecture this evening. Uh, rather, I shall follow the wise precedent of King Henry VIII, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> I am delighted to be in the presence of the Russian ambassador. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of being in the company of many ambassadors. They're all very, very uh, different. I was once told that an ambassador was someone who could be disarming, especially when his country wasn't. My favorite ambassador was actually a former American ambassador to the court of St. James, to London. A former admiral, at Bill Crow, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who became ambassador in London. And at a reception he was giving in the American embassy, which was then in Grosvenor Square, uh, he was smoking a cigar, which in those days was perfectly proper. But someone who knew about cigars recognized that it was a Cuban cigar, Havana cigar. And Havana cigars are illegal in the United States. And he said in front of everyone, thinking he was going to put the ambassador in an impossible situation, he said, Ambassador, you are the ambassador of the United States. You're a former chairman of the Orange Chiefs of Staff, and yet you're smoking a Cuban cigar, which is illegal in your own country. How can you possibly justify this? And he gave the most wonderful reply. He puffed his cigar, and he said, Well, you know, I was once chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and puffed his cigar again. And he said, whenever we sent men into combat, and he puffed a cigar, we said to them, the first thing you do is burn the enemy's crop. <laughs> now, tonight we are not talking about American domination. We're talking about American leadership. And that does not imply a monopoly of that leadership. The question we are being asked to decide is whether the United States can and should, and indeed in my view must, be one of the prime leaders of this modern world in which we now live, despite some of the controversies over the last few years. There is an inclination to suggest in some quarters that America has dominated the world for many years. It hasn't dominated the world. There have been two short periods when domination could be said to have been correct. One was in the immediate aftermath of the end of the Second World War in 1945, with when all the European economies were, had collapsed and the Asian economies had not yet grown, then America did dominate the world economically and therefore politically. The second period, you can say, was in 1990, uh, when the Cold War came to an end, and America had provided leadership of a remarkable kind over very many years. But it was also, of course, due to Mr. Gorbachev as well. I was privileged to be present when Gorbachev met Margaret Thatcher. And when Margaret Thatcher said, this is a man with whom we can do business. So it was indeed a joint achievement. But there is no doubting that the consequence of these uh, events uh, was dramatic for the short-term power of the United States. Because not only had this Cold War come to an end, but the Soviet Union, Europe's last empire, the Russian empire, had collapsed into 15 different countries. And indeed, of course, Communism as an ideology has disintegrated. Someone once rem it, it disintegrated because it couldn't deliver the will of the people. Someone once remarked communism only works either in heaven where they don't need it or in hell where they've got it already. <laughs> so there was, there was a vacuum and the United States filled it. An unwise American academic, Fukuyama, said it was the end of history. I don't like that phrase. I believe that as one door closes, usually another one slams in your face. <laughs> and what we have seen is the emergence of new crises, new threats, new problems. But let's go to the very heart of what this motion is about. 
What is global leadership? What are we actually looking to either America or any other country? And if it's not America, which country do we have in mind? Now, there are some global issues which don't actually require leadership. Every country wants to follow uh, prosperity for its people, wants to have good health for their population, wants to avoid uh, war and conflict if it possibly can. Of course, that is something which is not peculiar to any one government or one system. But there are certain issues of global leadership that are relevant to global values. And it is the war, the battle, war is the wrong word, I take that back. It is the contest of values that divides the world today, as it always does in the history of Europe and of the world as a whole. And what are these values? Essentially, what distinguishes not just America and not just Europe, but also much of Asia from, I have to say, Russia and China, is whether the values of governments being accountable to their people and able to be removed from office if the public do not like the way they are performing. That is a value that has not yet been resolved globally, but which requires leadership in order to advance. And the other is, of course, the rule of law, that governments themselves are subject to the law of the land, not just their citizens. Now, if President Trump was still President of the United States, I would not be speaking on this side of the motion. I think Trump is such a total disaster that I'm only marginally exaggerating if I say that if the only two names on the ballot paper had been Trump and Vladimir Putin, if I'd had a vote, I might just have voted for Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Don't, don't worry, if, if the ambassador takes that as a compliment, it means he's very easily satisfied. <laughs> Absolutely so. Uh, but the, let, let us be quite clear, what is the rule of law? I had a meeting with the Chinese foreign minister just before the handover of Hong Kong in 1997. And I said to him that the people of Hong Kong who I'd been visiting said they were concerned whether the rule of law would continue when they again became part of China. And I've never forgotten his answer. Through the inter interpreter, he said, don't worry, Mr. Rifkind, we in China, we too believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> I said to him, oh, no, hold on. In, the rule of law does not just mean that the people must obey the law. It means the government must obey the law. And I have to say, Ambassador, that neither Russia today, sadly, nor China, nor states of that kind, either allowed their electorate the opportunity peacefully and legally to remove them from office, nor do they respect the rule of law because they ensure that even peaceful opposition is criminalized. And someone summed it up beautifully. They said, democracies have the rule of law. Authoritarian states have rule by law. They use the law for their own purposes. And this is not a contest as Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin often suggests that between the West and the rest of the world, what our friends in China simply have not begun to understand is they are surrounded by Asian countries that have achieved not only the prosperity that China has, but achieved it 40 years ago, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. But most of these countries also achieved it with democratic systems of government, with the rule of law. And in the case of South Korea and Taiwan, they actually got rid of dictatorships, and that did not impede their economic progress. So the Chinese argument, somehow you must put up with the communist-type dictatorship because otherwise you won't get prosperity, is absolute rubbish. China would have been where it is now 40 years ago if it hadn't been for the lunacies of Mao Zedong and the great leap forward and, and so forth. So I come to the main thrust of what I want to say and the concluding remarks of what I will want to say, and it's simply this that if you wish to reject America as suitable for leadership, who else do you have in mind? And of course, there only are two other major countries that we're all talking about. One is China and one is the Russian Federation. And there are three reasons why they cannot possibly be seen as equal in claim to the United States. The first is, you know, if there is another war, which are the most likely candidates for another war at this moment? One is China's threat to invade Taiwan. And the second is Russia's continuing occupation, direct or indirect, uh, of Ukraine and possible further conflict there. If you want to see leadership, why is the president of Russia 
and the president of China, virtually two of the only leaders of the world who will not be attending the climate change conference that is taking place in a few days' time. 180 countries are going to be there. And these two heads of state who have the most to offer, far more than many of the smaller countries, choose to stay away. Not that's not leadership. That's a negation of leadership. And they sh that should be acknowledged. And thirdly, if we wish to say that it is a correct universal principle, not a Western principle, that governments should be accountable to their people and therefore able to be removed by their people peacefully and not through violence or revolution. I say with the utmost sadness that Russia today does not allow its people any choice of that kind, and nor does China. And so I conclude, I conclude with saying, not that America is perfect, but I recall what inevitably we always quote Churchill, what Winston Churchill once said. He said, you know, you can always rely on the United States to do the right thing after it's tried every other option. <laughs>